What's your favorite this much of this will end you fact? Story one. Not to end you, but if you eat too many bananas, like 40, you won't be able to come to my place of work because you will set off the radiation monitors. Have a similar story of a guy who set off the monitors at my old facility. We investigated, and it turns out he had just returned from a trip to Eastern Europe and had been consuming a lot of wild game and mushrooms in an area that still had enough residual fallout from Chernobyl to get picked up by our HPGD's whole body counters. We also occasionally would have big game hunters trip our system when they would be eating large amounts of elk slash big game animal meat, higher amounts of C's 137 compared to other animals' meats due to their diet. Story 2. Brazil nuts and selenium poisoning don't eat them every day or in consistently large quantities. I had to explain this to my father-in-law as I eat like one every day due to Hashimoto's disease, so I know the lethal dose. He went on a health food kick and was eating them by the bowl daily for God knows how long by that point. I told him to stop or he'd end himself, but he didn't believe me. The next time we visited, they were mysteriously gone, and he was completely unwilling to even acknowledge that he'd ever eaten them at all. Imao Story 3 it only takes 7 milliliters of hydrofluoric acid to absorb all the free calcium in the body of an adult human. Source, I work with HF and we have very extensive safety training and routine tabletop drills to cover what to do in case of exposure. Calcium gluconate can save lives. I've worked with HF too and they tell a horror story about a guy there before my time. A container of it got all over him in the lab, not his fault. He quickly stripped yelled at someone to call an ambulance, washed off in the safety shower, and started slathering himself with the calcium gel. The person who called said the ambulance could be there in 35 minutes, and because this was NYC, someone said there was a hospital only a few blocks away. So the guy grabs all the safety station gel tubes and starts running fully unclothed and shiny with gel through NYC. When he gets stopped at a red light, he waits and applies more gel. He finally gets to the hospital after sprinting there and tells them a bit breathlessly what happened and they gently reassure him while firmly moving him to the psych ward for running into the ER unclothed and covered in gel. The story I've been told multiple times isn't really consistent on how he convinced the doctors, just repeated himself enough times and asked for names of who to sue so when he dies his family will make a lot of money at least. But he does eventually convince them and receives the needed calcium injections and all before the ambulance would have picked him up from the lab. Safety first, kids. Story 4. One of my favorite trombone fun facts is that within a human lifetime you'll eat about a trombone's worth of zinc and copper, the metals that make brass. I had a kid once ask me, so if I eat a trombone right now, will I never have to eat zinc or copper again? And the answer was yes, because you would die. Edit. Okay. I checked a source for how many minerals we actually need in a human lifetime, and turns out my original source was way wrong. We apparently eat 950 pounds of copper and 502 pounds of zinc in a lifetime, so considering that a large trombone of 6 pounds provides roughly 4 pounds of copper and 2 pounds of zinc, that works out to around 250 large trombones or 500 small trombones eaten in a human lifetime. But you would still die if you ate an entire trombone in one sitting. Story 5 you can go and buy a bottle of Tylenol at damn near any grocery store, gas station, or pharmacy with 500 millimeter capsules slash tablets. It is entirely possible to irreparably damage your liver and kidneys with as little as 7,500 milligrams, so 15 pills in a single day. Sure, this number generally requires other comorbidities to be present, chronic alcoholism, poor nutrition, etc., but losing track of how many you've taken is reasonably common, all things considered, especially for individuals in mental decline, making acute acetaminophen poisoning one of the leading causes of acute liver failure leading to death. It is really not a fun way to go, either. Story 6. Potassium chloride, 
the stuff they use to stop your heart during an execution is also the same stuff they use as a salt substitute in low sodium salt products. Too much of that salt substitute can definitely end you, and there's even a tiny warning on the label if you look for it. If you search, you can find several cases of death attributed specifically to this product. People seem interested, so I'm posting the link where I originally read this. It's from The Straight Dope by Cecil Adams. Story 7. Two things you learn quickly in electrical engineering related to death, and one not related to human death. The first is the right-hand rule. When you are touching electronic components that may be charged, use your right hand as it is further from your heart versus the left, so it's less likely to end you if something were to go wrong. The human body is more or less a giant bag of salt water after all. The second is to always touch the back of your hand first. If you use your palm slash fingers, you risk the current causing your muscles to tense, and then grab and hold the circuit, and you'll be unable to let go until long after you're dead or someone breaks you off the circuit. Finally, if you release the magic smoke, the electronics are dead completely and totally. While refill kits exist, they are hard to find and ever harder to use, and capturing magic smoke is incredibly difficult. Story 8. Water. Not from drowning, but from drinking too much of the stuff. Eventually, if you really go overboard drinking water, the salt content in your blood will reach fatally low levels, and your kidney won't know how to cope and end up swelling your blood vessels with all the excess. Obviously, you don't want the swelling to happen in sensitive areas like the brain, but that's what kills you, in most cases, of water intoxication. Story 9. A very long time ago, I got into an argument with someone about fluoride in toothpaste. I think it was just after we watched a Chris Hadfield astronaut video where he demonstrated how they brushed their teeth on the ISS and he swallowed the toothpaste. The person I was arguing with was adamant that they were killing themselves by doing so. I did the math. I wish I had the post handy, but I forget where I even did it. To ingest a lethal dose of fluoride by eating toothpaste, it came to something like 70 pounds of toothpaste over the course of an hour for an average adult male. I'm spitballing now as I don't remember the exact figure, but it was a ludicrously high amount. Story 10. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure a gram or a little more of a blow in an evening is enough to OD slash kill the average person. As someone who partakes, it's absolutely crazy how many people in this world do blow. It can be extremely dangerous. And partly, depending on many circumstances such as who you get off of, how much you do, and other factors, safe. A very 50-50 drug that honestly doesn't take a lot to kill. Sort of a fun fact on that. Your body will straight up tell you when you've had too much, or have gone overboard and need to stop or slow down. Story 11, with the weight of an average male astronaut of 175 pounds on board the ISS, in order to fart hard enough to propel themselves forward to reach a relative velocity of one meter per second. They would have to expel enough methane gas to suffocate and kill everyone on board the space station. The volume of methane gas would be so great, the life support systems would be unable to cope with it, and the remaining astronauts would have to get in their spacesuits. Story 12. This is a recent one. Panera has been in the news lately for its charged lemonades that led to the death of at least one consumer. A large lemonade contains about 400 milligrams of caffeine. For reference, a cup of coffee contains about 100 milligrams of caffeine. Panera sells an unlimited drink membership that allows for free refills. And it's worth noting, the drinks do not taste like or are marketed as energy drinks. Adding to this, the drinks are mixed on-site by employees and it's entirely possible for them to get the ratios wrong and end up with a stronger drink. Drinking just two of these drinks puts you at 800 milligrams as well as over 200 grams of sugar. This is enough to send a person with a heart condition into cardiac arrest, which is exactly what happened with 21-year-old Sarah Katz, who worked as a research assistant at a children's hospital 
and managed her heart condition with medication and by watching her caffeine intake, Sarah Katz died in the hospital after suffering two heart attacks. Story 13. I discovered that essential oils will end you, and there is no cure. I had a bad cough so used eucalyptus oil to clear the muck in my lungs. You can get candle burners that take water on the top, put a few drops of eucalyptus oil into the water, and light a candle underneath. The heat evaporates the oil and you breathe it in. It definitely clears the lungs, but gives me a sore throat. Used it night and day. Began to feel weird. Discovered if you ingest 3G, you will have fits, and you will die horribly. No cure. Now I only use it at night, not during the day, to avoid the side effects. Story 14 sepsis can appear and kill you in a matter of hours. Absolutely nothing wrong with me. Even worked an extra shift the day my life changed forever. Driving down the side of a mountain, the valley lights twinkling below. Suddenly my eyes felt funny, and my vision began to go dark around the edges. I made it home just thinking, wow, I'm tired but normal for working 16 hours, kind of tired. So I went to sleep. I was woken up by my bed banging the wall and shaking. It wasn't the bed. It was me shivering harder than I thought possible. I got up, but fell back as waves of dizziness hit. Sitting on my bed, I noticed my right leg was red and throbbing from ankle to knee. What the hell? I say and realize I am burning up. My skin is hot to the touch. I pick up my phone to call someone, but I can't remember how it works, so I pass out. The next thing I remember is coming to the ER. They took my temperature to 105.6. After this, things are a mishmash of dreams, hallucinations, and terror. I was in ICU for two days with another three days in Reg Hospital. Doctor said sometimes sepsis just happens from a mosquito bite or other tiny break in the skin. So watch out for infections as even a little one can suddenly blow up and kill you. Or don't work double shifts. Too much work can end you. Story 15. There's an old boat paint additive called Tributiltin that's so poisonous that a concentration of one part per trillion can kill invertebrates in the water. It might be more poisonous, but we can't measure it any more accurately than that, so that's the minimum lethal concentration. For context, the ocean is 35 parts per thousand salt. Enough dissolved oxygen for fish to breathe is measured in parts per million. Lead is dangerous in drinking water at 15 parts per billion. For invertebrates, this toxin is so deadly that if you poured a gallon of it into the Hoover Dam, you'd endanger every crab and clam and bug in it. It breaks down quickly in oxygen-rich waters, and at the trillionth level, in some organisms, it only causes nasty birth defects and health issues. But still, fortunately, there's no reason to think it's dangerous for people, because they used an enormous amount of crap, like deck sealant and toilet cleaners. Story 16 there is a small evergreen tree called Texas Mountain Laurel. I have one growing in one corner of my house, and birds nest in it. A nice little tree, except that every part of the tree is poisonous. Bees love flowers, but if you buy honey from a beekeeper who has these trees growing nearby, the honey can sicken you. The flowers create seed pods that hold bright red seeds. Eating them will kill you, first with a creeping paralysis followed by a slow death. If an animal eats the leaves, it will die. But it looks nice. Story 17. Caffeine is an interesting one. Ostensibly, it can kill you, and has in fact killed some people who had pre-existing conditions or who were reckless with refined concentrates. However, for a healthy individual, it's almost impossible to OD on natural sources because it's also a powerful diuretic. By chance, the more caffeine you try to consume, the faster your body tries to flush it out, and conveniently, we drink it dissolved in hot water, exactly what the kidneys need. You probably won't hurt yourself if you have another cup of joe, might not want to toss back a handful of no-dos and wash it down with a monster, though. Story 18. More than six pills of acetaminophen in 24 hours can put you in danger of acute liver failure which is certainly possibly deadly, especially if your liver is already not in great condition, 
like, I don't know, alcoholics who are the people most likely to pop six or eight Tylenol to relieve a hangover without thinking twice. It's actually the number one cause of acute fulminant hepatitis in the U.S. Yes, Tylenol, little old Tylenol. Cute fact, the FDA only lets it continue to be sold over the counter because the manufacturers of acetaminophen convinced FDA that the cat was already out of the bag and acetaminophen was too widely used by the time the links to acute liver failure were proven. Story 19. Did anyone mention dimethylmercury? The tragic death in 1997 of rising chemistry star Karen Wetterhahn at Dartmouth College, Hanover NH, drove home the lethality of ME2HG. While studying heavy metal toxicity, Wetterhahn got a small amount of ME2HG on her rubber gloves, which were later found to be permeable to the compound. She began to experience toxicity symptoms, and less than a year after the exposure, she died. A few drops went right through the gloves and killed her. A lot of the things mentioned are somewhat voluntary, but this spooks me, because even with gloves on, such a small amount will kill you. A spooky excerpt from PubMed. Very small amounts of this highly toxic chemical can result in devastating neurological damage and death. It is one of the most potent neurotoxins known. It readily crosses the blood-brain barrier, probably due to its formation of a methylmercury cysteine complex. It causes ataxia, lack of coordination, sensory disturbance, and changes in mental state. It inhibits several stages of neurotransmission in the brain. It is a cumulative poison, being very slowly removed, excreted from the body, and by the time its effects are noted, it is too late to do anything about it. Story 20. Colchicine. Taken for gout to break up crystals. It's actually toxic, though, and too much of it will kill you. That's why it's prescribed in really small doses. Some people with gout might tell you to keep taking colchicine until you have diarrhea. My husband used to do that, but only recently learned you could literally be shutting down your organs and unalive yourself within 24-72 hours of an overdose. He's since tried other options for pain and swelling instead of this one. When I asked him about it, he said his dad's doctor told him to do that, but that was way back in the day, and he just took his dad's advice. Story 21. There's this old SNL skit that I have never been able to actually find after seeing it way back in the day, but Ed Asner was the host and he played a nuclear reactor caretaker who is going on his first vacation in like 40 years, leaving the plant in charge in the charge of a couple of newbies. And one of the instructions he gave them was, you just can't turn this lever too far. And then he was off to his vacation. After he left, they started staring at the lever. Wait, does that mean we can't turn it far enough? Or we shouldn't turn it too far? Cut to Ed Asner on a beach watching a mushroom cloud go up from his former place of employment and somebody on the beach says wow and ed says you know you can't look at a mushroom cloud too long and steps away leaving the beachgoer to ponder that story 22 i worked at a foam plant in college that made a bunch of products for printer ink cartridges i did simple autocad engineering things for extra cash on my first day my boss points to a rail car at the edge of the parking lot and says, See that? Those cars are sausage shaped so you know if they get out of shape they are about to explode. That one all by itself contains hexamethyl double death. It smells like almonds. But if you smell it, you are likely already dead. Story 23. Literally everything. Water, oxygen, vitamins, minerals. It does not matter. Dosage makes the poison. Water intoxication has killed more than a few people. Breathing pure oxygen, and only oxygen, will oxidize the tissues in your airways, effectively burning them. Vitamins and minerals are essential to our biology. Tuck into some polar bear liver, and you'll likely overdose on vitamin A, as stated in the top post. Eat too many Brazil nuts, selenium poisoning, and its ghastly symptoms. If you consume enough of anything, in a short enough amount of time, you risk overexposure. Story 24. I was a 20-year-old college student doing research at a lab. 
my job was working on developing a process to coat these detectors with a certain element. To do this, we were heating this gas under vacuum to 600 C to decompose it and coat these materials. This gas was deadly in as little concentration as 15 parts per million. I was tasked with wiring gas sensors to trip an alarm if there was a leak. I was told if they ever go off, just abandon everything in the building and get away. It doesn't matter at all what else is going on. We couldn't use the actual gas to test the sensors, but we followed 50-year-old literature that led us to believe that we could use this other gas that wouldn't kill us to test the sensors. It was an interesting project, but in the back of my mind, I was always thinking about how if something happened, I might die. Story 25. Breathing in a 100% oxygenated atmosphere can and will cause more damage than good. The air you normally breathe consists of 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. You can breathe comfortably with 20%. Nitrogen acts as a noble gas, at least if you only consider noble gases as glasses that you can breathe without too much risk. Oxygen, on the other hand, is pretty volatile and can actually literally end you if you breathe it in too much. If you have 100% oxygen, it means you can literally poison yourself with the thing you need to live with, which lowers your life expectancy. Breathing in pure oxygen is not a bad thing, as long as you don't do it 24-7 unless you have to. Mechanical ventilators don't actually give you pure oxygen, it just makes you breathe if you can't control your diaphragm. Story 27. You'll die faster without sleep than without food. After five days of no sleep, I started having micro-sleeps while walking. Mild hallucinations in the corners of my eyes, tracers, shadow people, and this weird thing where every object felt vaguely human-shaped and could have been a person if I wasn't looking directly at it. And they were always looking at me, waiting for me to make a mistake and fall asleep. Once in a controlled environment and behind a thoroughly locked door with heavy weights and a table propped up against the door, I finally fell asleep but had to do so in the middle of the day. I had tried it at night, hours prior, but the sleep paralysis and massive ear ringing would kick in with shadow people in the room about 20 to 30 times. After 90 days without food, I felt fine and ended my fast with a nice cup of broth. I promptly crapped my pants though. Story 28. Botulism caused by exposure to botulinum toxins is super lethal. It takes about one billionth of a gram per pound of body weight to kill a person. So if you weigh 200 pounds, just a fraction of a gram can end you. Similarly, an envenomating bite from a coastal taipan will kill you except there is first aid, anti-venin, and supporting care. My point is, are these lethal doses for botulism, etc., fatal irrespective of medical care? My questions on this are, what is the typical progression? At what point do symptoms drive people to pursue medical diagnosis and care? Upon presentation and in the following hours slash days, is the differential diagnosis typically successful? Is treatment successful? The answers lead to maps or flowcharts for various intoxications. They would be very interesting and possibly beneficial to doctors. There have been deaths because people didn't know they were infected with a toxin until it was too late because they didn't know what to look for. There have been deaths because people didn't realize how quickly hospital-level care might be required. There have been deaths that have probably resulted from doctors following health department policies with respect to treatments, especially expensive or risky ones or because they didn't have a good grasp of the characteristics of an unusual intoxication. I find these sequences of events and decisions absolutely compelling and deserving of organization as an information system. Well-designed visual representations of these flowcharts could be ideally educational for the public or presented as an app, and more technical versions could help make medical care more successful.